talking. So this is case one. It's an 80-year-old man with a scar-like plaque on the scalp. And you can tell from low power that someone has probably called this malignant on a biopsy at some point, because otherwise uh, we would not be getting this massive slab of tissue that goes from the skin, from the epidermis, all the way down to the basically the galea aponeurotica, which is right next to the periosteum of the skull. Um, and you can tell that the, the skin, including the, the dermis and the subcutis, are basically totally wiped out by this uh, process. And I want you to pay attention to a couple things from low power. Over here, you can see, even from low power, that there's solar elastosis. There's blue sun damage uh, here. And then suddenly that disappears and it's replaced by this process. Also, the fat is replaced. And look at these little aggregates of blue. Those will be important as we go zoom in closer. What we see is those blue aggregates are lymphocyte aggregates. And the dermis and the subcutis are replaced by a hypocellular spindle cell proliferation. There's a lot of collagen in the background. And this collagen, a, a little bit of it looks like reticular dermal normal collagen, but the most of it is new collagen. You can tell because it's got a different texture. It's kind of more sclerotic. There's all this bluish myxoid material, or uh, sometimes uh, uh, dermatology trained derm paths uh, often say mucin. Pathologists often say myxoid. When I say mucin or myxoid, I mean this blue ground substance hyaluronic acid in the background. So there's a mixture of pink collagen and mucin or myxoid background. And there are, it's low cellularity, but look at these scattered, very big hyperchromatic cells scattered throughout. Uh, this is as close as I can get in on these scans, but you can see even from here, very large pleomorphic hyperchromatic cells scattered around in here. And the other thing you can tell about new collagen is, look, this is the no patient's normal dermis for an old sun damaged person. They have uh, this, uh, this solar elastosis. And whenever you see collagen that's replacing elastosis, you can see it here, it's wiping it out. That means the collagen's new. It's being laid down since the person got old and sun damaged. So you got to figure out why that is uh, happening. And the uh, atypia here is the key that we're looking for. We've got the, the scattered atypia in this sclerotic and myxoid background is the key feature. And then we are seeing scattered lymphocyte aggregates, like I pointed out, even from low power. That is one of the most helpful clues. And finally, over here, I saw it. There it is. Look at this. A nerve wrapped around by these spindle cells. So this is a classic example of desmoplastic melanoma. These are very scary because they don't really look at all like conventional melanoma. When they're purely desmoplastic like this, they can be very challenging. They can look kind of like scar tissue or even like a neural lesion, like a neurofibroma. The, the clues are the scattered pleomorphism and the presence of lymphocyte aggregates, which are present in the majority of cases, although if you have a small biopsy, you may not see them. If you just had a shave biopsy of this, man, anyone could go down the tubes by thinking that that's scar and making a mistake. If you're lucky, you'll see a melanoma in situ component over top of these, but that's only present in about half of cases, give or take. So always, if you're thinking of desmoplastic melanoma, look for it in situ, but if it's not there, that should in no way um, detract from the diagnosis. Many cases of desmoplastic melanoma that I've seen did not have any obvious in situ component on the available areas that we that I had to look at in, um, in the biopsies or the excisions I was looking at. Now, when the 90% or more of the lesion is hypocellular and has a background of collagen like this, then we call them a pure desmoplastic melanoma. These tumors are, are interesting because they behave differently on a depth for depth basis. They tend to have a better prognosis than other forms of melanoma. Sometimes though, this will be, you'll have areas like this combined with more obvious nested epithelioid kind of conventional melanoma or more cellular spindle cell melanoma, which I'll show you some pictures of in just a minute. And in those cases, we say that it's a combined um, desmoplastic and spindle cell or desmoplastic and conventional epithelioid melanoma. Those melanomas behave more like uh, typical melanoma. But these tumors tend to be very locally aggressive and can really recur again and again. They usually, I would say, have perineural invasion, and sometimes that can be striking. They often are very thick, and I've seen many cases like this where at the time of diagnosis, the lesion was all the way down to the galea. 
And they, the vast majority of these that I've seen in my practice arise in the head and neck of elderly, sun-damaged, fair-skinned patients uh, most of the time. I've also occasionally seen them under acral melanomas on the palms and soles, and occasionally on the trunk or extremities, but I would say the majority are in the head and neck. So a very important lesion for head and neck and oral pathologists to be aware of. Um, and the other thing is, I mentioned they can look quite neural. The problem is, is that they stain very similarly to neural tumors. They will stain only with SOX 10 and S100. For the most part, there are some other esoteric stains that I have less familiarity with that I don't feel like are really slam dunk. But the main thing is that they, the ones, especially the ones that look very neural, they usually just stain with S100 and SOX 10, exactly like a neurofibroma or other neural tumors might stain. And MART1 or MELANA, whichever name you like, and H. HMB45 is often negative. I would say the vast majority of pure desmoplastic melanomas are going to be totally negative for those markers. If you have a component of other type of melanoma in there, then, then those tend to stain in those other areas of more epithelioid cells. They tend to stain with the more specific melanocytic markers. But look at that, how it's kind of that wavy look. So one thing that can help, the most helpful thing I think to tell these apart from a neural tumor well, finding the lymphoid aggregates and also finding mitotic figures. The problem is, is that you, on a small biopsy, you may not see any mitoses. But if you see a pleomorphic, scattered pleomorphism plus mitoses in a tumor that looks neural and it's on the head and neck of a sun-damaged older person, that's desmoplastic melanoma until proven otherwise, okay? So I think that's the main thing. And occasionally I get these where people will send them in and say they think it's a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. I have a whole long video on my YouTube channel about that entity. Um, you can check out if you want, but I'll just tell you this. I've, I've, uh, only seen ever one malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in the skin and it was a even then i only made that diagnosis with great trepidation because almost always those tumors are large deep masses almost never do they arise as primaries in the skin it's exceptionally rare and i would i would basically uh, never probably make that diagnosis on the sun damaged scalp of an old person. Um, if it's S100 and it's atypical, it's probably going to be a desmoplastic melanoma. Or again, maybe you got to think about neural tumors, which can sometimes have scattered atypia. So this case was desmoplastic melanoma. Let me show you a couple of pictures real quick to highlight some points that I wanted to make here. So if in doubt, if you see a scar-like lesion and it's got a little atypia and it's a sun damage site and they don't have a good reason to have a scar, do an S100 or a SOX10 to look. All these cells are going to stain. All the stuff here that looks like fibroblasts, almost all of that are uh, malignant melanocytes. Okay, let me pull up my PowerPoint here. And I've got some pictures here. These are from uh, uh, my dermatopathology survival guide that, um, and I'm using these with permission. This kind of highlights what we just talked about. And I'm going to skip past them, but you can uh, see this. I'll, I'll upload a PDF uh, to the meeting organizers you can have as a handout later. And you can go back to look at those. The main reason, where is it? Ah, here. I just wanted to point out that um, here's an example on, on uh, this side. We have S100 striking staining throughout the dermis. And on this side, those atypical spindle cells are totally negative for MART1. All you see there are a couple little nests. This one had a tiny, tiny component that was nested as well as a melanoma in situ component. That part stained with MART1. The rest of the lesion was totally negative and just stained with S100. So this is a great example to help explain um, that you're usually not going to have uh, MART1 and uh, HMB45. Those specific markers are not going to usually be present in pure desmoplastic melanomas. I wanted to show you a comparison. We looked at desmoplastic melanoma on case one. In contrast, this is what spindle cell melanoma is. It's cellular and spindle, and it looks like a sarcoma almost, much more cellular than desmoplastic melanoma.